So uh, Isaiah Johnson, I guess the Johnson, he was the, the steal of, of the draft. Why did you guys like him so much, and why do you think he was uh, still there? Did you say he's the steal of the draft? So, so John told him on the phone. So John told him on the phone he was the steal of the draft. Uh, boy, we, we loved him. Um, we think he um, compliments Trayvon Mullen, very similar guys, long. Uh, they both run. You're talking about six foot two, 200 pound guys that run 4'4. Four four. Uh, they're perfect in what we do. We're, we're a press corner team. Um, Jimmy O'Neill, our defensive back coach, is happier than I've ever seen him. Uh, so now we've got some long press corners uh, to go along with Gary on and, and uh, everybody else we have, uh, Conley, Gary on Conley and Worley and all our guys. So uh, bottom line is we're ecstatic with those corners. Mike, over here. Yes. For several years, at the end of the draft, you've been in a different mindset, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, I was already drinking a beer and having dinner. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you compare what it feels like for you right now? And I know you still have undrafted free agents and everything else, but to be in this moment now versus last year and the previous years coming off of a draft on television. Yeah, I, I, I'll give you a couple different thoughts. One is, uh, and I may have mentioned this to you guys before, I'm not sure, but um, – at Senior Bowl this year, I ran into Ozzy Newsom at a uh, – we're out to dinner. And I've known Ozzy forever. And I, uh, he congratulated me on the job, and I said, any advice? And uh, he said, Mike, he said, all I can tell you is that having an opinion is a hell of a lot easier than making a decision. And I think I said this the other night, and I, you kind of feel the weight of that in the draft room, especially when you're trying to trade back. And, you know, your head coach, like most coaches, wants you to trade up and go get their guy. And you're trying to tell Coach Gruden that, you know, if you trust me, if we trade back 10 spots, our guy's still going to be there and we'll pick up another pick. And John's staring at you and, 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 and just like and, – and you're just sitting there going, man, it's a lot different than NFL Network. And that guy better be there in 10 picks. Um, but it, it, the difference is just ownership, skin in the game. Uh, it, it, it just meant something different this week for me. And at the end of the day, we, don't know, we won't know how we did for a couple of years. Uh, but we couldn't feel better today because I think we stayed consistent with our philosophy and we drafted the kind of guy that we want to bring into this building. It made for some good television when they were talking on the network about you stumping the truck <laughs> in the seventh round. <laughs> yeah, the, the producer um, – Charlie Uke for the NFL Network texted me and he said, will you tweet something out and try to, because we used to play that stump the truck game on, on Saturday. And the irony was, uh, A, I'm not really tweeting anymore, but when he texted, when I finally looked down, I didn't see the message for a while. When I looked down, we were on the clock with, with, with Bell from Prairie View. And I thought, what, what a perfect situation to text him back, Quentin Bell as a stump the truck. And of course, he got the tax related it to the truck. The truck started looking for him. And then and that, immediately thereafter, they announced we took the kid. So it, it was just kind of cool. It all, it, you know, at, at that point, it was our final pick. I thought like, we, we could have a little fun with it. And uh, it was cool. Mike, you talked about the trading up and trading, and trading down. Yeah. You did trade up for Renfro. What was it about yeah. him that made you guys want to make that move up for him? Uh, Boy, I, I've loved his game I, for the last few years. I mean, when he caught that touchdown pass against Alabama a few years ago in the national championship game, <clears throat> when you're watching a lot of tape of kids um, and you're watching a lot of Clemson and a lot of Alabama and, and a lot of the teams that, that have a lot of draftable kids, you know, we get caught up in all Clemson's kids, you know, half of which we drafted, obviously. We get caught, caught up in the first round, the second round, and all these kids they had in their defensive front and then you put their offensive tape on and you kind of go, why don't people talk more about Renfro? And then we saw him up close at the Senior Bowl. And when I would go to the South practices, I'd just be like, he, he has an innate feel for the game as far as separation, how to get open. And I didn't even really care what he ran. He ran faster. At, I was almost, to be honest with you, I was almost disappointed he ran in the four fives at the combine because I didn't want people to notice him any more than, I mean, his production on the field was outstanding. He's got an innate ability to separate. Um, and when this is what I've learned from quarterbacks over the year, the great quarterbacks. They love somebody who can win quickly when there's pressure. 
Okay, when you're bringing six and you can only and you only got five blocking, and you're Tom Brady or or your Drew Brees, your Matt. Ryan. I've talked to these guys all the, over the years, and they've all said the same thing: give me a quick guy that can win in the middle of the field immediately when we get pressure. I think Derek Carr is going to love this guy. I, I really do. Um, I think we took uh, four or five senior bowl players. I got a, I got a text from the head of the senior bowl, uh, Jim Nagy, and the text was cool. He said. Uh, that was your fourth senior bowl pick from the South. Apparently, I gave you the wrong team. <laughs> so um, coaching and being there helped us a lot. It, was, it really is a big deal to be involved in that game. What did you like about Max Crosby in seeing him? Obviously, a guy coming from a smaller school in Eastern Yeah, he plays every snap like his hair is on fire. That's, that's number one. Number two, he has length. And number three, he ran in the four sixes low four sixes if I remember, at 255 pounds and six foot five. So he's got some twitch. He's got length, he's got twitch. He, he's got a great motor. What he doesn't have yet is power. He doesn't have strength yet, and he needs to develop that. When I got on the phone with him, I told him that um, his future was gonna be d dependent upon a Gruden, but not the one he thought. It's gonna be Deuce. You know, and I wanted him to get philosophically connected at the, at the hip with Deuce because he's got to get stronger. But, but I love this tape because he plays his ass off on every play. Hey, Mike, um, your seventh round pick, Quentin Bell, how unique is it for a guy to have a skill set that can not only play receiver but pass rushing uh, defensive end as well? We brought him in for one of our 30 visits. And, and I'll tell you what, our scout, Teddy Atlas, who I was just upstairs with trying to sign some free agents, Teddy Atlas did a great job. He kind of kept this guy alive in my mind, and that's what good scouts do. Like at first, I was like, "Oh, I got to hear about a, a wide receiver converted to, to defensive end, and he's from a small school." You know, come on, Teddy. And he kept bringing him up, and he kept bringing him up, and he said, "Mike, he was 240 pounds." I was like, "Wait a minute, he was 222 or 225 during." He said 240, and he ran 44, and that got my attention. And I believe, and I'm not sure about this, but we may have been the only team at his pro day. <laughs> we were all over him because of Teddy Atlas. He did a great job. Uh, and then when his numbers came out from his pro day, I had him earmarked in the back of my mind for that uh, a late seventh round pick because if he got to free agency, there would have been 20 teams bidding on him. Uh, so we took him off the board in seven. Teddy was there. There were more guys up there than than you guys were erroneously, erroneously told. <laughs> early, early in your GM tenure, I know we're only still a few months in, but um, you talked about how your tenure at the NFL Network prepared you for a lot of what was to come. There was one part of this draft experience that you never did get to experience until these past couple of days, which is to be on the phone with these prospects yeah. when they just learn that they're going into the NFL and they're going to be Raiders. What was that like for you to experience that for the first time? More cool than I thought. And um, I believe John Gruden is one of the best um, recruiters, one of the best uh, guys to be a face for a franchise. You know what I mean? I mean his energy is unbelievable. So I, I really believe that John should be the first voice they hear because that's who they associate the Oakland Raiders. John Gruden, man. He does an unbelievable – his energy, I told you guys the other night, like he's, he, was, he was just at me. When can I talk to him? When can I talk to him? Can I go call him now? I mean, he was – and it was awesome because it was so real. Um, then I would – for most of them, I would follow him in there and I'd go in and talk to the kids unless we had a trade working. Um, I got choked up a couple times. I really did, feeling the emotion over the phone. I mean, Farrell couldn't talk. I almost couldn't talk. Um, I get emotional about that stuff. Uh, it's kind of cool because I remember being a 10th round draft pick and I, rem I remember to this day getting the phone call from the Pittsburgh Steelers and what it felt like. So I'm excited that they're so excited to hear from John Gruden and to the extent I can add just a little bit, it's awesome. Mike, um, I know you and John talked about it the other night in relation to the, the higher rated quarterbacks, but you go through the whole draft and you mm -hmm. don't get a, a lower round. Mm -hmm. quarterback for developmental purposes uh -huh. or anything. Is there anything to that? Did you consider even getting a, a lower round prospect as a developmental quarterback or what, what you're thinking on how that played out? Well, we've got a young guy still with uh, Nate Peterman. So 
Um, John told the truth the other night. I mean, our job is to evaluate, and uh, we went out and did our homework, and that's, that, that's a position my head coach is always going to be ultra interested in regardless, and uh, we did our homework. Um, and obviously, we've been telling you for a long time, we think Derek is a franchise quarterback. Uh, it's going to take something pretty special to, to overcome that. We love Derek Carr. We love what he's, we think he's capable of doing in the future. Um, and we felt like we already had enough quarterbacks on the roster at that point. We've done our homework, and we didn't think any of the young later round guys could beat out who we have. Uh, just between uh, free agency and the draft now, do you, do you feel like you guys have sort of adequately addressed uh, the need that you had coming in at pass rush, particularly off the edge, and then also um, just taking a step back and looking at the draft class overall, what do you feel like you were able to accomplish? Well, to take the second part of it first, I, I think um, we just kept talking. You guys are tired of me talking about foundation players, but I believe in it, and and John shared that vision, and we we – we talked an awful lot about a lot of guys this week uh, who we want, who would fit this building. And I think what I'm most proud of is we stayed consistent through the entire pr process. From the day I got here, uh, with John and I sitting down and discussing how, what we want in this building, how to develop a team. You know, I try to tell people um, it's easy to, to kind of spend money in free agency or, or, or draft players, but the hard part is developing a team. And that's what we're trying to do. And we're trying to do it by improving and uh, strengthening our locker room with character and, and hardworking guys that love it. And that's what I'm really proud of. We stuck to that the whole time. You guys are all tired of hearing me say it. I know it. But that's what we talk about. That's what's most important. Um, as far as the defensive end situation, I mean, let's face it. We, we needed some defensive ends, right? And you guys have been harping on that since I got here. Uh, and we didn't think the, uh, the free agency was going to be the answer for that. I thought we did a really nice job here over the weekend to the extent that we couldn't even sign any free agent defensive ends because they saw we drafted three, you know, so they're all staying away from us. So uh, what we got, of course, we got Farrell, length, motor. We got Crosby, length, motor. And then we get this guy from Prairie View, length, motor, 4-4 four, four speed. Um, so we feel like for sure that's a position we've addressed and we're excited about. Mike, uh, can can you take us through what, what you liked about the uh, LSU tight end and then also just your evaluation of that particular position group as a whole, yeah. especially in relation to Darren Waller and maybe yeah. a great opportunity he may have to make an impact? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I've got to credit uh, Frank Smith, our tight end coach, for taking a late visit to LSU. Um, we had uh, Moreau was on the South team uh, at the Senior Bowl. And uh, I watched a lot of tape of him, and we liked him. And he wore number 18 at LSU, which, if you know the history and tradition of that number, means something. It means a lot about character and who you are as a person and your work ethic. So we knew who this kid was as a person. Uh, Frank believed that there was more athletic ability in this kid's body than we initially thought. Um, we saw him at the Senior Bowl. We liked him. We liked his work ethic. Frank went down late and worked him out and spent an awful lot of time with him. And Frank, the kid timed and, and worked out better than we all anticipated. I think he ran 4.62, if I remember, at about 255 pounds. And Frank came back all excited, like, hey, this kid's a little more athletic than we thought. Uh, I had a chance to get my hands on him, which means he's working him out and, and forcing him through uh, releases off the line. He, he's like, he's stronger, he's faster, and I really believe in this kid's upside. So what we think we found is a tight end that can put his hand in the dirt, and block, number one. Uh, number two, we think he's a little bit, bit better athletically than most people think. Um, and number three, we think he's a great complement to Waller, who you just talked about. Uh, I was talking to Waller upstairs today. Boy, he, he almost, I, thought, I thought we almost drafted. A minute, I looked at him and shook his hands. I thought it was Noah Fant, you know, from a height, size perspective. He looked very similar. Um, and he's a very athletic kid, so we feel like uh, we're hopeful that he can be our athletic displaced Y, and we're really excited about the uh, LSU kid, Moreau. Yeah, I'm uh, wondering if uh, one of the big winners this weekend was, uh, was Denzel Good. What do you see yourself at guard, and is he right now penciled in as, as a starter right now? Well, yeah, I mean, he has been all off season, um, and uh, I would imagine if we lined up today, I think Tom would probably have him there. Um, 
you know, it, it, he played pretty well at the end of last season. I'm not sure. You know, he's going to have to prove to us he's the long-term answer. Uh, he had some initial success at Indy at tackle, wasn't able to sustain it. You know, so we, we need to him to be consistent. I mean, that's going to be his challenge because he, he has the natural ability and size to be a starting guard in the NFL. But he's got to sustain it and be more consistent. Isaiah Johnson played a lot of special teams yep. at Houston. A number of guys on this draft class have. Can you discuss in terms of that being a, 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 kind of a foot in the door for a lot of these guys yeah. part of the active roster as yep. rookies? Who in particular do you think could be immediate contributor, contributors yeah. in that area? I mean, you got to understand, uh, Rich Bisaccia, who I've said forever is the best special teams coach in the NFL. Um, I've known Richie for 35 years. We were counselors together at the Joe Namath football camp and when we were in college. Um, he went to Yankton, which I had never even heard of until I met Richie. Anyway, uh, Richie's been all over me in this process about bringing in special teams players, and, and that has to be a special thing. Uh, and if you go down our list, the Clemson kids will all play. I mean, they love it. You know, I, uh, Richie got a phone call from Abram. Actually, Abram was in Richie's office yesterday, and he went in. And think about this. This is a first-round safety. He went into the special team coach's office to say, can I play on teams? And Richie said, yeah, I got you, I got you scheduled for uh, punt team. And he's like, what, personal protector? And Richie said, no, you're going you're gonna to be a flyer. And the kids started jumping up and down. Like, a lot of people run away from that, especially high picks. John Abram can't, wants to be the flyer on punt team. I mean, that's, so when you look down our list, you know, the Clemson kids all want to play. Jacobs is a really good kick return guy that was on all the Alabama special teams. Okay, so he can play it. Isaiah Johnson, that's going to be his initial task. You know, he, he runs 4-3-8. He better get his ass downfield, make tackles on punts and kickoffs. Uh, he's going to be a core special teams player for us. Uh, same thing with Foster Moreau. Uh, Hunter Renfro is a backup punt returner, very solid hands. Uh, Quentin Bell runs 4-4. Um, we, we're going we're gonna to sign the uh, fullback that we had in the Senior Bowl from Alec Ingold from Wisconsin. He's going to be a great special teams player, and that's what attracted him to us in, in addition to being a fullback. So huge priority, huge, huge priority special teams. Mike, just a couple things for me, more, more things here. But going, circling back to, to day one on Farrell, it, did, did you guys get a 40-yard time? I mean, yeah, 40-yard dash time on him because he didn't run it. Nobody time. did. Nobody did. Everybody asked him for workouts. Um, everybody asked him. We had him out to dinner uh, what last week or whatever on the 30 visit, and he got teased unmercifully by Christian Wilkins, his teammate, which was really funny. You know, Wilkins kept saying, hey, I ran 503, but at least I had a time. <laughs> how, how comfortable were you with that in, in terms of you know, pulling the trigger? I mean, obviously, Look, John, John and I had to, to do it. Yeah, but. John and I had the conversation, and, and it was kind of like, you know, does it bother us he didn't run a 40? Yeah, a little bit it does, especially because he's such a hard worker and everything. And um, I, I finally just I, – John and I had the conversation. It finally kind of went – I just said, listen – we got, we got three years of tape. If we can't figure out where this kid can rush the passer and set an edge, it's on us, not on him. Mm -hmm. One last thing. When you think back to the, the television years and post-draft, how did you evaluate yourself? When I mean, obviously, you, you, you had a great reputation, but like all evaluators, sometimes some, some picks went awry and things like that. How did you process that when you were in – that realm, and I know, like you said, you've got skin in the game now. No, but no, I, take I, us to that. No, I took second. a lot of pride in it. I think any, you know, you should, right? So, um, I didn't really care about the mock draft I did the night. I put a lot of time and effort into it, but I knew that you know some grandma in Encino could probably do better than me picking names out of a hat just because one trade trade can change the whole thing. So, um, for me, it was just all about trying to be the GM for all 32 teams. And I felt like if, if I fairly and honestly portrayed what each team needed and why, and why each pick was made and hopefully why, or if I disagreed with it, maybe open up a, a kind of a different position respectfully. Um, and I, I felt like if I did that consistently for 250-some picks, I had, I, had a, I had a good weekend. And I, took, I tried to take pride in being prepared and ready to go. Yeah, before this weekend, you had said that John said, uh, you know, here are three first-round picks. Don't screw it up. 
a warning that do you now turn around so here you go don't, don't screw it up <laughs> pretty much <laughs> it's, it's a really good question and pretty much uh i tell you what we 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 when we got done today we had a big hug and uh just we feel like in the last four months between free agency and the draft we've been consistent we've got the people we want in this building and nothing's been, nothing's changed yet. We're a four and twelve football team, and we got to prove it on the field. But we think we got a little bit better each day. Two more guys. Mike, um, are you guys going to exercise Carl Joseph's fifth year option? I, I think that's a conversation we'll have with Carl. When you spoke with Max uh, Crosby today, uh, we, we saw the video, and you talked about you know John being, you know, you, you go up to John and, and talking about his film and kind of just tapping on his shoulder about this guy. And I thought it was a good example of just a synergy between you two. Can you detail that a little bit more in terms of what the back and forth was like between you two throughout the process from a pre-draft pre st standpoint and then these past three days? Are you talking about Max or are you talking about just generally? Um, just generally, you and, yeah. you, and, you and Gruden. I couldn't be happier with our, with the way our relationship has developed. And... Um, this is a guy with a strong opinion, okay? And, and he brought me in to have an equally strong opinion. Um, and I think that's the important thing to, to, that people have to understand. I didn't come here to just kind of try to set a board. I, I came here to work with John and try and help him build a football team, a championship football team. Uh, I also knew I had to come in here and earn people's respect. I knew a lot of the people in this building, coaches, et cetera, but you know, step number one for me is always you got to earn people's respect, and that's how I look at it every day of my life. Um, so John and I spent an awful lot of early mornings in this building watching film, arguing about players. Um, you know, I, I was in with the coaches, I don't know how many days in free agency and draft prep, just me, John, and the entire coaching staff grinding tape together and arguing about players. And I was – uh, vehement about the kind of guy we want to bring in this building. I had a lot of, you know, coaches just want talent. Sometimes they don't really care about the rest of it. They want talent. And, and I think it's, it was a really good, um, I think we complement each other uh, because when, when, when I had a strong opinion, John listened. And, and when John has a strong opinion, I listen. And we go at it a little bit, which is really good. But at the end of the day, I think the important thing is when we make a decision, it's a Raider decision. And when we bring a, ra a kid in this building, when we, we, can, we can disagree all we want. But when that guy gets drafted or signed by the Raiders, he's ours. He's a Raider.